Imaging of the trachea. This review focuses on the imaging appearance of various benign and malignant tracheal diseases. An evaluation of the central airway should be performed on patients who have symptoms of strider, wheezing, adult onset asthma, hemoptysis, or recurrent infection. While the chest radiograph is the examination of choice for screening patients with these findings, abnormalities may not be apparent on the chest radiograph, and additional imaging is usually necessary. CT is the imaging modality of choice in this case. Occasionally, MRI is useful, particularly in young patients, in order to spare ionizing radiation, or in patients with vascular or mediastinal lesions. An understanding of the normal trachea is important for tracheal diagnosis. The trachea is a cartilaginous and membranous tube, approximately 10 to 12 centimeters in length, that extends from the cricoid to the carina. It is comprised of multiple C-shaped cartilaginous rings that form the anterior and lateral walls of the trachea. The posterior wall is a membranous structure formed by the tracheal's muscle. And on expiration, the membranous trachea will invaginate into the lumen of the trachea in this fashion as seen on this expiratory image. Note also that the lung attenuation is higher than on inspiration due to the lower lung volumes. These are ways to identify an expiratory image. Multi-detector CT is a fast and reproducible method of imaging the trachea. The trachea can be imaged in seconds. That data set can be reconstructed into multi-planar reconstructions, in addition to which 3D virtual bronchoscopic images and surface rendering techniques can be generated. On the left is a virtual bronchoscopic image of the carina, from the bronchoscopist perspective. This is the right main bronchus and left main bronchus. Notice the invagination of the membranous wall on this expiratory image. And on the right is a 3D rendering of the trachea and bronchi. There are some tracheal anomalies that we should be familiar with, the most common of which is the tracheal bronchus, otherwise known as the pig bronchus. This is a small bronchus that usually arises from the distal right lateral wall of the trachea, two to three centimeters above the carina, supplying a portion of the right upper lobe. Generally speaking, a normally located right upper lobe bronchus will also be seen arising from the right main bronchus. On axial images, we can see the small tracheal bronchus coursing into the right upper lobe. This has clinical implications in patients who will be intubated so that this bronchus not be occluded. A cardiac bronchus is a rare anomaly that arises from the medial aspect of the right main bronchus or the medial aspect of the bronchus intermedius. It generally courses towards the heart, hence cardiac designation. These are typically blind ending, small bronchi, but occasionally will supply a small amount of lung that has a pleural investiture. Most patients are asymptomatic, but occasionally patients will present with hemoptysis or recurrent infection. One can see on this axial image the medially located cardiac bronchus, medial to the bronchus intermedius, and on this coronal image, the same bronchus extending medially towards the heart. There are a number of entities that cause tracheal widening. Tracheal diverticula, or cysts, are true diverticula that represent mucosal herniation of the tracheal mucosa through the tracheal wall. The vast majority occur in the right posterolateral aspect of the trachea at the thoracic inlet. They are usually asymptomatic incidental findings, but are commonly associated with patients who have chronic obstructive airways disease. In these images, one can see the normal trachea and lateral to that a small air collection re representing a tracheal diverticulum. Tracheobronchial megaly, otherwise known as Munier-Kuhn syndrome, is a congenital condition in which there is defect in smooth muscle and elastic tissue. As a result, there is diffuse dilatation of the trachea and main bronchi with a characteristic scalloped or corrugated appearance in which the mucosa protrudes in such a fashion between the cartilages causing this corrugated appearance of the trachea and main bronchi. 
These patients are prone to recurrent infections and may in time develop bronchiectasis, as seen in this patient with bilateral cystic bronchiectasis. And in some patients, they will develop tracheomalacia. In another patient with Mooney or Kuhn syndrome, one can see the typical corrugated appearance of the trachea and main bronchi, diffuse dilatation of the trachea and main bronchi on coronal and axial views. And on this virtual bronchoscopic image, looking from the proximal trachea towards the carina, one can see the diverticula protruding between the cartilaginous rings and the dilatation of the trachea diffusely. There are a number of entities that cause tracheal narrowing. Post-intubation tracheal stenosis is seen here. This is represented as an hourglass configuration, generally one to four centimeters in length, that characteristically will occur at the site of a cuff. It will be seen in the proximal trachea as an hourglass narrowing here on a chest radiograph with the correlate on the coronal CT imaging as a smooth concentric narrowing with a typical hourglass configuration. Here on the axial image, one can see significant stenosis at the level of the thoracic inlet. CT is useful in differentiating this type of stenosis from narrowing of the trachea from an extrinsic compression by an associated adjacent mass. Most commonly, th this might be caused by enlargement of the thyroid gland, as in this case in which the thyroid is diffusely enlarged causing tracheal narrowing from extrinsic compression. Other common causes include vascular anomalies and aneurysms. Post-traumatic tracheal stenosis can occur in cases in which there is incomplete tracheal tear with preservation of peritracheal connective tissue. As a result of the preservation of the connective tissue, pneumothorax or pneumomediastinum may be absent. These often will present with a delayed presentation because they may have been missed at the time of the trauma. When they are seen in a delayed fashion, one can see a focal stenosis or an hourglass stenosis at the level of injury. On the right is a typical post-traumatic tracheal stenosis, which was quite focal. Notice the misshapen trachea here in the proximal trachea and the soft tissue density surrounding the trachea consistent with fibrosis. Note that the anominant artery is closely opposed to the anterior tracheal wall and represented the anominant artery forming the anterior tracheal wall following this injury. A saber sheath trachea is an abnormality of the intrathoracic trachea. It's seen in older male smokers, typically with COPD. It results from abnormal intrathoracic transmural pressures and chronic coughing and causes an abrupt change in the configuration of the intrathoracic trachea that begins at the thoracic inlet and extends to the carina. The narrowing occurs transversely and is best seen in the coronal plane or in axial planes. The coronal diameter will be less than one half the sagittal diameter. In this patient with saber sheath trachea, notice the diffuse narrowing of the trachea beginning at the thoracic inlet and widening on the lateral view. CT image nicely shows the transverse narrowing in this patient with a saber sheath trachea. Relapsing polychondritis is a rare inflammatory disease affecting the trachea diffusely. It affects the cartilages of the ears, nose, upper respiratory tract, and joints. It's caused by recurrent cartilaginous inflammation followed by fibrosis and calcification in some cases. It typically will spare the membranous wall, which does not contain cartilage. Respiratory tract is involved in 50%, and many patients suffer from recurrent pneumonia. On the right, notice that the cartilaginous wall is diffusely thickened and contains calcification, both in the trachea and main bronchi, and typically spares the membranous wall. In a different patient, 
One can see diffuse thickening of the anterior wall of the trachea, in which there's some calcification, sparing the membranous wall. Notice in the coronal view that the cartilaginous portions are diffusely thickened laterally as well. Tracheopathia osteochondroplastica is an uncommon disorder seen in older males, in which there are multiple submucosal osteocartilaginous nodules that form along the anterior and lateral walls of the trachea. This entity also spares the membranous wall. Tracheobronchial cartilages are thickened and become nodular, causing luminal narrowing, and in some cases may cause significant narrowing of the airway. Ossification can form within the nodules. In this axial image, notice the nodularity and thickening of the anterior and lateral walls of the trachea in which there is some ossification, sparing the membranous wall. And this correlative bronchoscopic image demonstrating these nodular submucosal deposits protruding into the airway. In a different patient, on these axial images, again, one can see ossification within these nodular areas of thickening in the cartilaginous portions of the tracheal and bronchial walls. In another entity, granulomatosis with polyangiitis, otherwise known as Wegener's granulomatosis, this is a granulomatous vasculitis that has a propensity to involve the upper and lower respiratory tract, kidneys, and other organs. There can be diffuse involvement of the trachea and bronchi or focal involvement, and narrowing can occur as a result of the diffuse thickening. Subglottic location is the most common area of involvement in the trachea, although the trachea and main bronchi can be involved at any site. There may be associated mediastinal lymphadenopathy and associated sinusitis, as seen in this patient, with thickening of the maxillary antrum. In another patient with GPA, you can see diffuse thickening of the proximal trachea in a circumferential fashion, extending inferiorly into the mid-trachea. Amyloidosis is another uncommon entity that can affect the trachea. Extracellular deposition of proteinaceous fibrils occurs in the tracheal wall, which will stain with Congo red. This can occur focally or diffusely throughout the trachea and may present as focal nodularity or diffuse thickening and may cause airway obstruction. It can also calcify. There can be associated lymphadenopathy and in some cases, there will be enhancement by intravenous iodine of focal lesions. In this axial image through the distal trachea, one can see a mass-like filling defect obstructing the airway in which there is dense calcification, representing a focal mass-like amyloid deposit. In another patient, on these axial images, one can see diffuse thickening of the cartilaginous and membranous walls of the trachea and main bronchi, which are densely calcified, representing a diffuse form of amyloidosis involving the trachea and bronchi. And in this third patient, with more focal disease, there is a circumferential area of diffuse thickening in the proximal trachea, seen here on the axial view and here on the sagittal view, causing luminal narrowing by this deposit of amyloidosis. Fibrosing mediastinitis is a granulomatous mediastinitis typically caused by histoplasmosis or tuberculosis. In this entity, there is typically widening of the mediastinum caused by deposition of fibrosis within the mediastinum, which may calcify and may encase normal structures, causing narrowing of the trachea esophagus, or vascular structures. In this case, you can see that the carina is distorted and the proximal main bronchi are narrowed, and that the soft tissue extends into the subcarinal region and encases the right upper lobe bronchus as well. Tuberculosis can cause a stenosis. 
There are multiple ways in which this can occur. Extrinsic compression by lymphadenopathy can cause narrowing of the trachea or bronchi. In the acute hyperplastic stage, tubercles form in the submucosal layer of the trachea, cause ulceration and necrosis, and thickening of the wall, which can narrow the lumen. And in the fibrotic stage, in which there is healing, fibrosis can cause a smooth stenosis. The mechanisms of infection in the airway include contact of the mucosa by infected secretions, typically in patients with active infection in the lung with cavitation, or submucosal spread through the lymphatics. In the hyperplastic stage of tracheobronchial tuberculosis, there is a regular thickening of the tracheobronchial walls with resultant stenosis and sometimes adjacent lymphadenopathy that will contribute to the narrowing. Typically, in the hyperplastic stage, there is evidence for active disease in the lung that may manifest as cavitary disease or tree and bud opacities, as seen here in the periphery of the lung. In a separate patient with hyperplastic stage of tuberculosis involving the airway, one can see significant diffuse narrowing of the tracheal wall, which is very thickened and somewhat irregular and extended into the left main bronchus. On inspection of the lungs in this same patient, one can see bronchial wall thickening, tree and bud opacities bilaterally, consistent with active tuberculosis. And in a separate patient with a fibrotic stage of tuberculosis, one can see diffuse narrowing, smooth narrowing with stenosis of the left main bronchus on this axial image and on this correlative bronchoscopic image with narrowing of the left main bronchus compared to the right. There are a number of tumors that can affect the trachea. Several benign tumors can be seen. The squamous cell papilloma is the most common benign tumor. It correlates with patients who are smokers and typically occurs in males more often than females. In this entity, one sees soft tissue, intraluminal nodules, and is, these are typically non-invasive tumors. The hamartoma is the second most common benign tracheal tumor. And in many of these patients, CT can identify fatty or cartilaginous densities that are useful in making the diagnosis. However, these specific tissue components occur in the minority of patients. These tend to grow slowly and often present with obstructive airway changes. Chondromas are uncommon benign tumors that occur in middle-aged males. They typically arise from the inferior surface of the cricoid 70% of the time. They contain cartilaginous calcification and they often cause airway obstruction. On the right is an image of a chondroma at the level of the cricoid, which is polypoid, extends into the lumen and significantly narrows it and contains typical cartilaginous calcification, making this diagnosis possible on CT. Tracheobronchial papillomatosis results from a viral infection from the human papillomavirus, generally acquired at birth from an infected mother. Juvenile laryngeal papillomatosis is usually confined to the larynx. However, over time, in older children, adolescents, and young adults, these papillomas may spread throughout the trachea, bronchi, and into the lungs. They are typically polypoid or sessile masses containing a vascular core and well-differentiated squamous epithelium. The pulmonary involvement generally manifests as pulmonary nodules or cysts. In this patient with tracheobronchial papillomatosis, one can see polypoid lesions arising from the lateral and anterior walls of the trachea. And on this 3D rendering of the trachea, one can see these same lesions in the trachea as well as the main bronchi. In this other patient with papillomatosis, one can see an obstructing lesion at the level of the carina, nodularity extending into the right upper lobe bronchus, narrowing the bronchus intermedius and including the, left, the right lower lobe bronchus by this large mass that has 
developed representing transformation into a squamous cell carcinoma. Note also the thin wall cysts that are present in the lung, quite typical of pulmonary involvement in this entity. There are several malignant neoplasms. In fact, most tracheal tumors are malignant. The trachea can be involved secondarily by adjacent malignancies, such as carcinomas of the thyroid, esophagus, or lung. And it can be involved hematogenously by metastases from melanoma, breast, renal, or colorectal cancers. The most common malignant tumors of the trachea are squamous cell carcinoma and adenoid cystic carcinoma. On the right is an image of a focal endoluminal mass causing significant tracheal obstruction caused by a hematogenous metastasis from melanoma. Squamous cell cancers of the trachea generally occur in male smokers. These are irregular nodular tumors that cause narrowing of the trachea, thickening of the wall, and often extend into the adjacent soft tissue by local invasion. They are associated with regional lymph node spread and hematogenous metastases. In this same patient, a coronal image demonstrates a nodule area of thickening in the left lateral wall of the trachea, seen on this 3D surface rendering of the trachea. Adenoid cystic carcinoma typically occurs in the fourth decade of life and is not smoking related. Either mass-like, it can be circumferential, or it can present as diffuse thickening of the trachea. It most commonly will occur in the distal trachea, and it has a propensity to spread submucosally along the airway, can spread to regional lymph nodes, and typically has slow growth. On these cone down views of the distal trachea, one can see an intraluminal mass on the frontal and lateral views, which on CT is seen as a polypoid lesion obstructing the airway and causing significant thickening of the left lateral wall of the trachea. In a different patient with circumferential tracheal involvement, one can see diffuse thickening of the tracheal wall encompassing the posterior as well as the anterolateral walls and extending into the adjacent mediastinal fat. Similarly, on the coronal view, one can see circumferential narrowing of the trachea by this mass extending into the mediastinal fat. And on the surface rendering, one can see the mass arising from the left lateral wall of the trachea. And in this next patient with adenoid cystic carcinoma, one can see the typical submucosal spread of this large circumferential tumor at the thoracic inlet spreading down submucosally along the wall of the trachea bilaterally. Mucoepidermoid tumor is a rare tumor. It's generally seen in younger patients with a mean age of 36 years. It can be high-grade or low-grade malignancy. It usually presents as an endobronchial mass in the large central airways and rarely can present in the trachea. It has a nonspecific appearance and is difficult to differentiate from other carcinomas. In this other patient with mucoepidermoid carcinoma at the level of the carina extending into the right main bronchus, one can see a polypoid mass causing significant airway obstruction and no local invasion. And lastly, tracheomalacia will present in patients as chronic cough, dyspnea, and recurrent infections. It can be diagnosed by CT imaging, by demonstration of excessive expiratory collapse of greater than 70%, with the typical frown sign as seen here on correlative inspiration and expiratory images through the mid-trachea. Note the normal circular configuration of the tracheal on inspiration and the invagination of the membranous wall causing significant narrowing of the airway in this patient with greater than 70% collapse of the airway. This is a typical example of the frown sign seen on tracheomalacia.
On these sagittal images on inspiration and expiration, one can see the normal configuration of the trachea on inspiration and the significant collapse of greater than 70% of the lumen on expiration. And in another patient with tracheomalacia, one can see in this patient an elongated membranous wall on inspiration with profound collapse of the trachea on expiration. Nicely demonstrated on axial imaging, but also seen on inspiration and expiration examinations in virtual bronchoscopic images. So in conclusion, CT is the imaging modality of choice for evaluating tracheal abnormalities. Many benign and malignant diseases affect the trachea primarily and secondarily. Familiarity with their imaging appearance enhances diagnosis. Thank you.